first we're going to bring up Eric Geiler. He's the CEO of a Watertown company called uh, Ytricity. Uh, and so, um, Eric, if you're mic'd up and ready to go, come on up. So um, let me, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, explain to you just a little bit about the company and then show you some of what it's about. So real simply, Ytricity, wireless electricity. It's a little bit of a hard concept to get your head around. Um, when I first heard about it, by the way, I, I didn't go to MIT. I went to Carnegie Mellon undergrad, which gave me my uh, tech cred, but I got educated across the river at Harvard Business School, which gives me, I get no end of crap from my colleagues, right? Because when you work with a bunch of PhD physicists and engineers. Um, the, the idea for this technology actually came from a professor at MIT in the physics department, Dr. Marin Solyacic, who was kept awake by his wife's cell phone beeping, running out of power every night. And about the third night that it um, uh, ran out of power, he was thinking, with all this electricity running around in the walls, why couldn't some of it just go into the phone? And he came up with this concept, uh, mathematical theory to use magnetic fields which are actually very safe for people. And you, you saw on my first slide, safe, efficient, and distance. He came up with this concept. He went back and figured the math out. Ultimately, nobody believed him because wireless electricity actually exists in the form of lightning, which is kind of dangerous, right? That's electricity in the air. Uh, there's magnetic induction, which is probably the closest technology. The problem with magnetic induction, those of you that are technical, it's Basically, every transformer in the world has a couple of coils in it. And those coils, when you put electricity on one of the coils, it creates a magnetic field, which induces one to the other magnetic, magnetic field on the other coil. Problem is you can't pull the coils apart. They have to be almost touching, and it stops working. And the, the math that he figured out suggested that it would be possible if you got them to oscillate at certain frequencies and, and keep them magnetically resonant with each other that it would be possible to do this. Of course, nobody believed him. Um, so when he went to get the uh, research published in Science Magazine, um, they said, you know, if you could prove that it works, we'd publish it. So he put his team up there. And you'll see up there on the, um, up here, here are two coils in a transformer. One's called the source. One's called the device. There's a light bulb hanging off the side. But fundamentally, they're about 60 centimeters in the distance that the power is being transferred. It's about two meters. And I can attest to the fact that everybody in the picture is alive. So um, you know, sort of proved that safety and, and uh, uh, that it worked. Once that happened, the school got deluged with calls, emails, and everything else, thousands of them. And the school, um, like we heard in A123 example, um, I was brought in as a business guy, licensed uh, all of the technology on an exclusive basis from the school. And actually, a lot of what we do has a lot of IP in it. I think this was done. Um, it, actually, the number is we have over 125 patents uh, on file. And the first ones are actually starting to grant now. Um, if you think about why you might want to do things wirelessly, almost everybody thinks about convenience. But what they don't think about are the other two that are on there. So let me just touch on it sort of very briefly. Uh, environmental friendliness. If you could, disposable batteries, not rechargeable, but disposable batteries, we built in the world something like 40 billion of these in 2006, according to a study done in the UK. Every one of those ends up in landfill somewhere, and it's probably the most expensive form of power you'll ever find. It costs on a disposable basis about $300 per kilowatt hour to deliver power from a disposable battery as opposed to the US grid, which works at about 10 cents a kilowatt hour on average. So it's about 3,000 times better if you could use the grid. People don't think about that. Electric vehicles, as popular as we think they're going to be, the auto manufacturers have been concluded that if you have to plug them in to charge them up, there's going to be a, an adoption curve that has to go up to get people to do it. Reliability, if that wire breaks and you have a problem, you know, it could cause a significant uh, difficulty that if you could go wireless, wouldn't it be nice to be able to do that? Not surprisingly, handheld devices are probably one of the most popular things that we've heard about, just because 20 years ago they didn't exist, and now they have an insatiable need, whether they're replacing batteries in a wireless game, in a wireless game controller or recharging your cell phone. 
fixed electronics, while you don't move them around a lot with the advent of these t television sets, you know, you could hang them on the wall, but they have these ugly cords hanging off of them. Um, anything, if your desk probably looks like that underneath with those cords or you're the consumer of the batteries, anything that can kind of go at a battery or a cord is a good candidate for going wirelessly. And industrial stuff, uh, it's a little more obscure, but by the way, there's big money in it. I know oil drilling is particularly a uh, hot topic right now. If you were to look at this, that's an oil drill. You'll see that little gap in there. All the oil company drilling companies want to do is get power where they have lots of power there. They like to get power from there to there. And they have to use wires right now because it's not possible to do it. Um, robotics, the same thing where you have lots of stuff moving around. And then finally, electric vehicles. We've had probably one of the biggest interests in being able to just drive into your garage. There's a mat on the floor. There's another coil or resonator, we call them, sitting underneath the uh, car, and it can put power back into uh, the vehicle and charge it the same as if you plugged it in. Um, and there are lots of other applications, too. We're building a broad-based business by supplying components, chips, coils, and intellectual property that go into other companies' product lines. Team is technical uh, by nature. I'm, I actually uh, am a tech entrepreneur. I've been sort of kicking around for a while. And Ray Stata, who's the investor, first investor uh, in the company through his venture capital company, asked if I wanted to come to a place that's going to change the world and sort of coaxed me out of retirement to come back and do this. So we're working with uh, 20 employees out in Watertown on top of an old clothing factory. And uh, as Scott mentioned, had gone through about $15 million in uh, fundraising at this point. And Hopefully, that's all we'll have to do. What I'd like to do is take a couple minutes and show you how the technology works. I'll start with um, the basic physics principle. So here are two coils. If this were a transformer and you put them together, you could, you'd be able to get the light bulb to light by putting alternating current on one side and getting a magnetic field to be created. But if you pull them apart, they'd stop working. For those of you that are physicists, this is infinity in transformer land. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just plug in AC power. I'll put it, I convert it to DC, just off the wall, and put it at a high frequency, 6.78 megahertz. It'll create a magnetic field that will create one here. And hopefully, if the, uh, all this stuff is willing, be able to light a uh, light bulb at a distance. So you're looking at a 100-watt light bulb being powered um, completely wirelessly. That was sort of a, just the same type of experiment we saw done at MIT back, but something that we could easily carry over to the Weston. What I'd like to do um, next is show you how some of that stuff could be applied. So I get my buddy Steve here uh, to help me here, but here is a source resonator. So we're putting a magnetic field on it. In this case, it's about 250 kilohertz. And we put a coil on the back of the television set. You'll see it there, and he'll just uh, try to stand it up on the back of the thing here. I always get nervous doing these demonstrations, because when we were fiddling around with this before, I'm worried the TV is going to fall off and crash to the floor. But I uh, think it'll hang in there for a minute or two. OK, good. All right. See what I mean? So it gets me a little nervous. Scott and I had tried this recently. Actually, somebody <laughs> called me afterwards and said they were more worried about the TV falling off than it, work, than it working. So when you put power on it, what will happen is, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but how do you get a TV to turn on remotely when you just stick AC into the back of it? So we put a little microprocessor in the uh, system here. What you're seeing is a television set turned on completely wirelessly. And by the way, you know one of the issues is um, what's interesting is the technologists uh, you know, people will say, oh, it's safe. You know, people that are concerned about safety, is it safe for humans? The engineers say, oh, wow, the TV keeps working. <laughs> it's the difference between people. But one of the issues is you can, get, you can get lots of different things to work this way, including, by the way, fairly small devices. So here's an LED light source. When I place it in the, um, I don't know if you can see that with the camera, but you can get the relatively small uh, coils as well. And then, of course, going back to Dr. Solyachich's original idea, we actually put one inside the phone. And when I put it up in the field, you'll get the phone to come on, and the telephone will actually just start charging as well. So you're looking at 
multiple devices. It works from sort of one to many and, uh, you know, really promises to uh, fundamentally change the world. So I think five years from now, you'll, maybe you'll remember back when we did this and it'll be one of those things that's perfectly normal. And uh, you'll say, oh, I remember seeing that back a few years ago, right when it came out of the labs at MIT and turned into a commercial venture. So anyway, thank you very much.